Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 1 Corinthians. Uh, we continue on in the study of 1 Corinthians. We made it into the second chapter last week, and we're nearly through, nearly completed those notes, and I would like to finish out those notes, and then we'll step in, if time permits, into our second uh, portion of chapter 2, which is really from, chapter, or from verse 6 down through verse 16 is a continuation, really from the beginning all the way through uh, verse 16 is really one continuous thought, but because of uh, how much information is there, we're going we're gonna to slow it down and break it up this whole chapter into three parts, uh, and I believe it will be a help to us. And if you have your notes from last week, we made it to the seventh point, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. I just want to uh, sweep through this and, and conclude it so that we can continue on understanding. And the next portion, which I entitled The Wisdom of God, concerning these uh, verses here and then after uh, this the service uh, well after the preaching we'll have our communion of course first uh, corinthians chapter 2 hope you found your place the bible says beginning in verse number one and i brethren when i came to you came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of god for i am determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in the weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdoms, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And I'll continue on through verse 10. The Bible says, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Our God, we ask you tonight to visit with us and help us to understand this, these words and help us, Lord God, to be able to apply them that we might use them in our uh, efforts to go out and to reach the lost and dying world. God, I, for whatever reason in my mind now, I, I'm thinking of all the many people that we know that have backslidden, that have gotten away from you, who in this moment right now are not in church, not because of work, not because of the illness, but simply because they're backslidden. Lord God, I pray a special prayer for them. And Lord, you would help us to reach out to them and to encourage them to return to the house of God, that they might restore their fellowship with you and be revived again. Would you help us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We've looked at, uh, concerning this which uh, this last lesson, uh, my preaching, we looked at preaching is to be declarative, it's uh, preaching is to be determined. We looked at how preaching is to be demonstrated, in, and it's not just the preaching of the pastor, it's not just the preaching of the evangelist or the missionary, but it's the preaching of all the servants, all the ministry workers, which is, Every one of us serving God, our lives are to demonstrate Christ in all areas. And we come down to number seven. If you have your notes from last week, I, I'm in number seven, verse number four, we see the Bible says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The power to change lives is not in words. We use of ourselves, nor is it the delivery of those words. Uh, the power is in the word of God itself. And the only words that have power are the ones that God spoke that we deliver as from him. Many people try to conjure up some kind of uh, impressive sounding sermon. And that's why you have churches where the men will uh, very eloquently speak things that are not true. And people will follow them because they're moved by the feelings and emotion that there's no power. It doesn't change their life. It simply changes their mind or it changes the moment. 
but it does not change them. The power of God is uh, shown to us in the changing of one's life. And that's why when somebody gets saved, you can watch them and see something happening in their life. And uh, for some people, it's quickly. For some, it's longer. But you always see the power of God through the Word of God changing their life. We see this phrase, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Demonstration, uh, that word there is the only time in, in the New Testament the word is used. The word literally means to show forth or uh, manifestation. The words of the Spirit, the power to change life, does not rest on us in our presentation, but rather on the Spirit working through us as we give out His Word. This manifestation, the demonstration of the Spirit, was seen in Corinth through the miraculous gift of the Spirit in the city, and the church saw as described in uh, chapters 12 to 14, which we'll get to later. Now we see this phrase, and of power. It's defined or described in verse number five as the power to change lives. Verse number five says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our faith ought to be put into something when the Bible defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. It is simply stating that God is already put in place in the void that's there, whatever it is. And that's what faith is, seeing what's not there as though it is. When you put faith in men, they can. Uh, we have no ability to... Uh, if you put your faith, in, for instance, in a man to, to meet you at a certain time, I just know he's going to be on time, and maybe that man will be on time every time if he could control all the circumstances. But if you're in Crestline Long, you get stuck in a train, a train <laughs> sooner or later, and it changes... And so you could not put faith in something because our lives are always changing. But God is unchangeable. You can put faith in him because what he says he'll do. And that's what this verse is trying to tell us and trying to remind us that our power must be demonstrated by God and not by man, not by our abilities, but by his. That's why God chooses people who have the least of abilities, who are the least uh, capable of the position and puts them there, because then in their weakness, his power is made perfect. We see uh, the phrase that your face should not stand in the wisdom of men. He again comes back to this point to show that it's not of us. This doesn't mean the education isn't necessary, that we aren't to study as some teach this. Other scripture would prove that wrong. This is to show them uh, that the power is there to change a life for Christ in us. My stepmother is, uh, was a very, very devout Catholic. She grew up, she was uh, in um, basically a boarding school, a Catholic boarding school away from home. She lived there. She was trained uh, in their schools, went to college through a Catholic university. She had all those teachings of the Catholic Church. And I can tell you that this, when I put in here that uh, some teach that you don't need to study because your face should not stand in the wisdom of men. That's not true uh, for us, but for them, they tell them don't study. Don't read your Bible. You can't understand. You need a priest to interpret it. That's right. And, of course, we know that that's not true. We know that everybody can individually come before God and study the Word of God, and God can speak to you just as He speaks to me. I'm amazed at how oftentimes somebody will come to me who's newly saved and sit down and said, I was reading the Bible, and they'll begin to show me what God showed them, and I'll have to read it three or four times and say, man, I've read that so many times, I've never seen that one time. It's because God speaks to all of us if we're willing and willing for him to speak to us. The phrase, but in the power of God, three times already in this letter, this phrase, power of God, is used 14 times in the New Testament. Our faith stands in his power. That's what makes it eternal. In 1 Peter 1.5, the Bible says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Our faith is in God. Our preaching is demonstrated in God's power, not our own. There are people who, and you may think of some, maybe at some point in your life it was you that, that you're going through the motions and you're pretending to be a 
a, a righteous person, a holy person. I know people, I know preachers that got saved 20 years into the ministry. They had, for a long time, they had put on a show. They had put on uh, the, the, the religious outfit, if you will. But then the power of God got a hold of them. The power of God got into their heart and soul and divided and showed them that they were just simply going through routine. They were simply religious. The power of God keeps us. The power of God shows us. And it's by his power that we demonstrate to the world his saving power. In conclusion of this uh, first lesson, we find that too many today feel that they can't be an effective witness for the Lord because they don't know what to say or they don't know how uh, about much about the Bible. These verses show us that it's not because of how we present the truth that matters, but it is the truth that matters. And all we have to do is give them the simple message of the cross and let the Spirit demonstrate the power to save, His power. To say, Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, and to the Jews first, and also to the Greek. And now we uh, come to this next portion of Scripture, these next five verses that I believe are so powerful, and that's the notes you should have received tonight. And if you didn't, I believe we have some more back there. But uh, verse number 6 Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that came to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world to our glory. This part gives us some help in knowing that although the world may consider what we do as believers as foolish, we can know from the word of God that it is not. In fact... As we'll see in some of these verses uh, that we have in Christ wisdom beyond what the world knows or even can know. It may seem foolish to the lost, but to us it is wisdom beyond understanding in more than one way. The first word of verse 6 gives us an idea of a change in the view of what was before. It doesn't negate it like the word but would, which is how the word is mostly translated, but it it takes what was before and adds a different dimension to it, a different consideration of the truth that's before you. The words wisdom, the world's wisdom, we saw in the uh, last couple weeks, in the last uh, several, really, since the beginning of First Corinthians study, is <coughs> no, no con uh, consequence and of no value to the world today when it comes to eternity. I'm not saying that we shouldn't will be willfully ignorant and live that way in life, but we need to make sure that we don't use the world's wisdom to try to explain God or explain his perfect will. As we'll see in the message, the ability to know God and his perfect will is only found through him, only comes from him to those that truly desire it. As we look at these verses, the, only, the, the one thing to understand through it all is the gospel message of Christ and man's acceptance of it. And then the truth that follows the acceptance is what is meant by the wisdom of God. So the title of the message, what has God prepared for those that love him? What we'll see is not something we're looking for in heaven, but rather something we can see right now, right this moment. God tells us if we we'll ask of him, He'll give to us liberally wisdom. The issue is that we don't seek God's wisdom. We want to know how to get through this life and to succeed in this life. We're almost afraid of the wisdom of God. And if we truly are desirous of it and we obtain it, that's when we see the power of God demonstrated day in and day out in our life. Brother Will was sharing with me, uh, talking to me about a man who's him and his wife have demonstrated the Christian walk very uh, their entire life. They have a ministry uh, here in, in Ohio, and he spoke of them, and uh, they, they have a desire to serve God. And he said, "There's of all the preachers you hear and all the stories you hear, he can give a, a, a story, illustration after illustration of true events of the power of God in his life, God doing miraculous things. He prays for specific things, and God gives it to him. 
And I wonder tonight if we were to search our hearts and our lives, how often do we find God answering specific requests in our lives? And Brother Will was a specific answer to prayer. You guys, uh, we asked for a piano player. I asked God for a piano player before I moved here, even before you guys voted. And mm -hmm. God delivered. That's an answer. Uh, to me, that's a miracle of God. The way it all came about, it was certainly a miracle of God. But how often do we see that happening in our lives? How often do we see the power of God? And if you look at your life and you can find places where God is very specifically answering those things, you can know this, that you have found the wisdom of God and are continuing to find the wisdom of God because his power is displayed in your life. We find, first of all, in verse number six, wisdom that matures. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. This verse, uh, or first of all, the, this wisdom builds. The verse points to the truth that the, the more mature we become in Christ, the more of his wisdom and truth we'll desire. That's what the word perfect is. It's not when the Bible speaks of Job and it speaks of him being a perfect and just man, a perfect and upright man. When the Bible speaks of a saint being perfect, it's not one that's sinless. It's not one that's uh, without error. We never obtain that. But you can become perfect in the fact that you've become wise in God's wisdom. You're perfect. Job was perfect and upright. Noah was perfect and upright. Uh, why? Because they sought God's wisdom. And they saw the power of God displayed in their life time and time again. And it ought to be the desire of our lives, of our hearts, for our families, to see the power of God displayed so the next generation can see it. As you seek the wisdom of God, you won't but help sing the outward working of God in your life. Brother James taught in Sunday school this morning uh, on that, uh, the teaching on, I, I, me and him went over and I caught little bits and pieces. I was going through the hallway, listening to speakers, uh, that teaching on passing on those things that God's taught you, passing on those, those things that uh, God has taught you down through the years. The Bible commands us to do that. And as you're able to demonstrate and tell others about the power of God in your life, it, it makes them desirous. It, it's a, like that little bit of salt in the, in, the, in the food that causes you to crave a little more of that, that perfect seasoning. In Maryland, we have Old Bay. We put Old Bay on everything, from chicken to seafood. I put it in oatmeal. I mean, it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> that, once you get that one little dab of Old Bay on your tongue, it changes everything. It makes you want more. More grass back there. Yeah. Want some blue crab with some old bay on it. Oh, man. I hope you guys have dinner already. <laughs> we see the words we speak. The common word for uttering words. In this context, it speaks of the imparting something through those words spoken. This is one of those purposes of preaching as we do in the church service to impart wisdom. The purpose of that preaching is not only to take the word of God, but to help us to relate to it, to be able to illustrate it in our own lives and the world around us, what's going on, so it becomes real to us, so that we take a hold of it and make it something that we apply in our lives, search for. Wisdom, the word, it means skill or expertise in any art. It refers to the wisdom of God. As one said in respect to divine things, wisdom, knowledge, insight, deep understanding represented everywhere as a divine gift and including the idea of practical application. It's when you can take knowledge and apply it to life, then you gain wisdom. It's why I, I've spent most of my life uh, attracted to men who have that are not only aged in, in, in uh, years, but are aged in spiritual walk because they have knowledge, but they've watched it play out in life. And so they have wisdom, which is what I desire. I want to know how these things are going to turn out. Uh, the Bible tells 
the, the aged men. It tells the aged women to teach the younger women. Boy, wouldn't our country be in a better state if we had kept on doing that and not, not left off those things uh, that we should have been teaching those young ladies and those young men. A lot of that confusion today, and, and it's not all the aged fault, not at all. And sometimes they just don't want it. They reject it, but oh, there's so much wisdom to gain from those who have gone on before us, applying that knowledge. Then we see this, among them that are perfect. The wisdom of God is seen by the Apostle Paul as he writes to the carnal Corinthian believers as something that only those that are mature in Christ will truly comprehend. The, uh, the spiritual wisdom builds over time, and the more we have, the more we'll want more. That really needs no illustration. But the more you have, the more you're going to want it. The more you read Scripture, the more you want to read Scripture. The more you pray and walk with God, the more you're going to want to pray and walk with God. And the first time you see God do some kind of big miracle in your life, you'll spend the rest of your life wanting to see another big miracle in your life. Amen. One after another. I can testify to that. Every time, it's just not enough. I want to see it again and again and again. And that's why I still... And looking for a great revival. Because it's the one thing that I haven't seen God do. That I've heard about. And I've seen little bits and pieces. I've seen men and women be revived and restored in serving God. But I've never seen a, a city revival. But I know he can. Because men have told me about it. Women have told me about it. They've, they've told me about the things that happened. And the, how the, the bars were shut down. And. The old town drunk got saved and got right with God and, and started serving God. And now as a preacher, I've heard those things. And I long to see them myself. We'll continue on next week in this. I don't want to go further. For I want to take be able to have plenty of time for the communion service tonight. Wisdom that matures. The wisdom that matures is one that also builds. Our God, we thank you for your word and I pray Lord God that you would help us to be able to understand your word help us Lord God to have a desire that burns so deep a fervor a zeal Lord God that keeps us wanting to know more about you and uh, Lord God I pray that you would help us to obtain that give us liberally as you promised be with us now in the remainder of this service for it's in Christ's name we pray amen